Um, I'm actually pretty excited to um, be able to moderate this uh, debate and the sixth um, episode of the SEMS webinar series. This time we'll be talking about uh, geographic differences in gender equality. So we have two wonderful women uh, here with us today, Nina and Rebecca is joining in just a second, um, who are gonna talk about um, the topic. So uh, maybe just on that, on that note, I'll just um, give the, uh, the work to Nina to actually tell a couple of words about herself and, and what she's doing and, and where she is in her career and, and what she's been doing at SEMS. Uh, and then we can, we can move on from there. Yeah, hi. Um, so very excited to be with you all today. Um, I am a SIMSI that recently graduated uh, in 2017. So my home school was LSE and I went to VU in Vienna um, and had a wonderful time at both schools. Um, after I graduated, I um, joined a fintech startup um, and that fintech startup is called Bud. It is based around the idea of open banking and open finance. And um, it was a wonderful experience to really further my interests in fintech um, along with my passions of financial inclusion and financial literacy. Um, I recently left, oh, well, not recent anymore. It's nearly been a year. Um, to join Klarna, which uh, is a Swedish fintech company based in Stockholm. And uh, it is live in, I believe, 14 markets and should be many more by the end of this year. And I was originally hired to go and open up our West Coast office in Los Angeles and have since come home. Well, home is actually California, but have since come back to London. And I am now um, working on multiple projects um, over in the UK office. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I should continue with with specific questions, but maybe we can. Maybe I can ask you a couple of things about um, um, about your experience at Sam's. Can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know what was your favorite thing about while you were doing Sam's and what did Sam's gave you? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think for me, I, as you can probably tell from the accent, as I've already stated, I am uh, from California originally, so I'm American, um, but I am actually the daughter of two immigrants. So my father is Indian and my mother is Taiwanese. And so I grew up in a very multicultural um, environment. I would definitely call myself a third culture kid for those that know the term. And um, in the U.S., it is, I think, actually, there are a lot of third culture kids, but I think there's not as much um, in terms of diversity from people who have lived in different countries and that sort of thing. So one of the best parts of SEM that I found was it was a return to my childhood, my upbringing, which was being surrounded by people who are quite literally third culture kids, are quite literally required to speak three languages fluently um, but also have a breadth of international experience which makes their life experiences very rich um, and I think adds a lot of nuance and perspective to their workplaces to their relationships whether personal or professional all right and uh we have Rebecca on now can you hear us Rebecca yes I can hear you well Really, that's perfect. Okay, so I'll give you the word now to introduce briefly yourself. Maybe you can touch a little bit upon your SEMS experience, and then you can tell us about what you're currently doing and what was your what were your career prospects until now. Okay. Um, yes, I graduated from St. Gallen in '98, so it's a while ago. Um, I did my SEMS year in Belgium and with an internship in Brussels and studies in Louvain la Neuve, and yeah, I liked it very much. Um, I just I was just attracted to this fact of having multiple diplomas in multiple places at once, and yeah, really wanted to do that. Um, so after St. Gallen, I joined the Monitor Group, and I worked a bit in South Africa and in Spain and Germany and Paris. They had global staffing, um, and then I was drawn back to studies. So I did um, a master's in London and at the LSE. 
also Sam's uni, and then started working for Frontier Economics, who do sort of common, um, yeah, um, uh, economics-based consultancy, and um, started my PhD at UCL and kept working. So I wanted some dual higher education. Um, did my PhD at UCL, and then um, Frontier seconded me one year to the Prime Minister Strategy Unit, and um, there I got exposed a bit more to public sector policy making, especially in the areas of education, health, social protection. And so once my PhD was done and my secondment year was over there, I joined the World Bank. And that's where I still am here in Washington. I worked in the Latin America regions, in Eastern Europe, in um, um and now in Africa and in the Middle East, actually, for quite a long time as well. And now in Africa for the past three years. So West Africa in particular, Burkina Faso and Cameroon. Yeah, and I enjoy that very much. Um, my sector is um, social protection and jobs. So that's what I concentrate on and my teams concentrate on. Um, and yeah, I'm about to go on mission. We call our business trips missions. We regularly supervise what we do, what we finance in the field. So I'll go on mission. Um, next week and yeah very much looking forward to that um is, did that answer your question or did you yes. have um I think that's a great introduction yeah. okay <laughs> great thank you so much i think it's uh, i think it's great that that we have both of you because uh you have a very very broad experience from many countries on, on many continents so it's actually really cool that that we we can talk about the topic and then we can touch it uh, on so many different levels um, and and we can have understanding of what are what are the, the what are the geographical differences of gender equality. Um, so you know maybe just to kick it off, I'll, I'll obviously start with like a, a very um, basic question um, that that we've been discussing. So maybe each of you can can give us a little bit of your understanding of what is the definition of gender equality and how you define gender in your life. Maybe Nina, you can start. Sure. Um, so I call myself a feminist, and I think that definitely encompasses a lot of gender equality. I subscribe to um, Chimamanda Adichie's definition. She's a Nigerian author. Um, I'm sure Rebecca was would be familiar with her, and I'm a big fan of her work. But uh, she defined feminist as a person who believes in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. And I will add to this that um, more than just that, for me, gender equality is nuanced because um, it is a social thing and it, it, it must be intersectional. So for me, it, it also needs to include people of all races, all socioeconomic levels, all education levels, sexualities, sexual orientations, disabilities, everything. Mm. Um, and for me, perhaps to be a bit controversial, gender equality is not, is not reached when, you know, wealthy white women are, are happy with where they stand in the world, but really gender equality is reached when the most marginalized people in society are properly represented and made to feel equal. Great, Katie, I like that. And I like you citing um, Chimamanda Adichie. I love her, like absolutely love her books. So we need to continue this conversation afterwards. Yes, absolutely. She's wonderful. Um, Look up her books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, I have them. Um, so basically, yeah, you touched on several aspects I wanted to mention as well. For me, gender equality is basically three things. It's um, the equal access to like a good start in life. So like being born into sort of um, an, an equal um, situation of wealth, an equal situation of health, and, um, and an equal access to education. So for boys and girls, having at the start of life, having the same access. And then as you grow up through the life cycle, having the same access to um, this, to economic opportunities. So whether you work or start a business, having the same access to um the same right and access to um, generating an income as, as boys have. Um, and then going beyond that, and you touched upon that as well, um, what we call agency. So having decision power over yourself and having influence over society, 
um, having um, appropriate decision power in your family, um, everything, yeah, we, agency. So these three things, I think, are gender equality. And absolutely, we actually, at, at my workplace, we, we, we struggle towards achieving that um, in, in all the countries where we work. That's great. Thank you so much both for, um, for that elaborate uh, definition. So maybe I can ask you then, um, do you perceive um, that there has been any change over the past years in your personal perception of gender equality? Um, do you think anything mm -hmm. has changed in the past years? I've, yeah, I've, I've, I feel I've become a bit more sensitive towards it. So, I mean, not, not only because it's become more of a, a topic, um, but also I've, I've added perspectives to my own. I've got two daughters, nine and seven, and I sort of, I see how they are exposed. So they're more in this start to life period. And I see how they are spoken to, how their education works. And um, I see some better and some worse developments. I mean, I see some really good developments in the way that the education is very sensitive to gender equality these days. And also the way they are spoken to and treated is quite empowering to them. And in the books they are exposed to, um, they have this book called Rebel Girls and it has, yeah, it has Tima Mondadici in it, it has Angela Merkel in it, it has Marie Curie in it. Um, and so it's, it's um, a very different way of, of raising kids and I see that it's uh, very positive. Um, well, not so positive, um, the US has not been able to vote in a female president like since forever and just again. So that's that's quite a sobering reminder that so much still remains to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe to piggyback off what Rebecca's just said, um, I think that's a question later on down as well that I've felt very passionate about um, speaking to. But for me personally, um, I'm not fortunate enough to have any children yet, but um, I think in my own growing up, I, I've realized that my personal perception has changed and that my original perception of equality was um, quite selfish, actually. So I, I did not understand really what it meant to be intersectional. I didn't understand um, the needs of others, the agency of others. And so the fact that I grew up in the Silicon Valley um, from an upper middle class family um, that you know, I, I had an excellent education. I, I never really wanted for anything. I had plenty of opportunities. It didn't occur to me until probably the past few years. And it was a learning experience that, um, that this was all privilege that I have um, and still hold and bring with me day to day. And so I think my perception has become far more nuanced um, as I take into account other people's perspective, whether they are older than me, younger than me, um, across different, you know, social settings or whatever, um, and and increasingly in the professional arena as well. So the perception of how far we've come or what we have left to do has also made a marked impact on me. <laughs> I see. All right, great, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so maybe then I can ask you uh, a very specific question on, on have you ever actually experienced gender inequality? And if you can give us some examples of that. And of course, how did you actually approach that situation? If I can jump in quickly off the back of what Rebecca just said, um, as an American, um, yesterday, and I'll be honest, even today was um, quite difficult and sobering for me. Um, to see Elizabeth Warren drop out of the, the Democratic primary race, which means that effectively, at the very least, we won't have a female president in the U.S. until 2025 um, to be sworn in. And um, maybe very apropos to quote, um, Elizabeth Warren was asked how gender played out in the primary race. And she said, you know, that's a trap question for every woman. If you say, yeah, there was sexism in this race, everyone says, you're a whiner. And if you say, no, there was no sexism, about a bazillion women think, what planet do you live on? So I think to, to kind of echo her, I think a lot of women don't ever want to complain because they don't want to be seen as difficult or whiny. But I think 
if you really get women behind closed doors and you have a glass of wine in, in your hand, most women will have experienced um, gender inequality. I work in fintech, so I am at the crossroads of two of the most male-dominated industries, um, finance and technology. And so for me, it's a day-to-day -day battle where some are very blatant and open. Um, and some of them are perhaps a bit more microaggressions and far more subtle, um, whether it's asking when I plan to have children or if I plan to have children and will that put me on the mommy track, uh, whatever that means. There, there is no, no shortage of those kinds of things, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is such such a, a great pitch. It fully resonates with me. Um, I mean, I'm I'm the senior alumna of the year, right? So I'm old enough to have a long list, unfortunately, of things I could cite. But I don't exactly. I don't want to start um, um, whining. And I think the what you touched upon. I think becoming a mother is statistically um, a, a key driver of um, inequalities between men and women and it's so I'm I'm not making that up but you can see it in in the statistics and um I have the fortune of working at a workplace where there, where there are a lot of women um but still I've yet to see a workplace where this you know motherhood doesn't make a difference it's just um that's how it is and I must say over the years I'm now in a bit of a different place in the sense that I don't hesitate to kick up a fuss I don't. I know the our institutions, um, internal and external, and whether for myself or for others, I go there. I kick up a fuss and I pull the levers that I can. Um, but I also must say that um, probably um, just looking at individual cases may not be that effective if it's a systemic issue. And that more systemically, I feel just letting the light in, just making things public, um, making sure people know. Um, that really helps. So even publishing salary scales, publishing um, what is um, available, who actually progresses in the organization, who doesn't and why, um, making all of this public, I think, holds people accountable. Mm. I actually was recently at um, a talk for the launch of a book, um, Difficult Woman, uh, by Helen Lewis. And it was, a talk, it was an Intelligence Squared talk and was speaking and she wrote um invisible women which is a book about data bias um against women and um to your point exactly uh, helen lewis was on stage and she said um the plural of anecdote is not data and so while we are able to tell you so many stories i completely agree with rebecca which is that people respond to data um, and the more you have of it to back up your case, um, I mean, that's what they teach us at Sam's, isn't it? Always have a business case. The more data you have to back up um, or and show that actually having more women on boards actually increases the profitability of companies or um, the retention of employees or whatever, um, the more likely we are to see change or affect change. So in that case, you know, I'm hearing from you. I'm trying to understand what what, what is the best way to deal with it. Uh, I'm hearing be vocal, uh, kick kick up a fuss, you know, back it up with data, make a business case. Would you say these are good advices? Um, yes, I think that's um, that's definitely something um, you can do. Sort of, yeah, building the business case, also allying yourself with with others. So, performing an alliance. I mean, this is this is very systemic. We are fifty percent. Um, and so, um, yeah, and making sure, um, and, and thankfully, in, in our management, there is a relatively high representation of women. It is not 50%, um, but it's, I think it's between 30 and 40 right now, which is not too bad. So there are people to reach out to and to form an alliance with. Um, does it, it's, it, it's a tricky question to say, does it work? Because I feel we're ever not, ever not far enough. There's still so much to do when there's implicit bias. That is actually, um, I think, a big important topic, the implicit bias, the unconscious bias that we all may have. And um, Harvard University has this tool. It's um, the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. You can do it online on yourself to see what your biases are. Um, 
And I think that's very important. Anybody who should go into a leadership position should take this test just to be a bit self-aware. Um, and if you don't have a bias, awesome. Um, but and also encourage others to take it because I think that's this, the subtleties that Nina also touched up on, I think can be more dangerous even than the more visible things. Um, that unconsciously women are criticized for being abrasive, aggressive, ambitious, um, you know, things that are not that bad for a man. Or oh, this is implicit bias. What was so, the, like, addressing that, I think, is important. What was the two again called? Um, the two IAT, Implicit Association Test. Okay. And it's it's been developed by Professor Banaji um, from Harvard University, B-A-N-A-J-I. That's a good uh, for some of the people that might be interested in that to write that down now. Okay. Um, Nina, do you have anything to add or...? I mean, I think Rebecca's absolutely, yeah, she said it all. I, I think um, we we talk about kicking up a fuss. I think there is something to be done um, no matter who you are, where you are. Um, in a professional setting, I am a huge fan of President Barack Obama, and I recently read that, for example, the women... Um, there, there's a there's a phenomenon called mansplaining, uh, colloquially called, where oftentimes a man will jump in and explain something um, as if or to a woman as if she has no understanding of it. Oftentimes, uh, she is actually quite expert on the subject, or has actually just said something, or there will be kind of an appropriation of an idea. And I read recently that in the Obama administration, a lot of his female staffers would um, create an echo chamber. So what they would do is if someone said um, something that was a great idea, then some another woman sitting in the room or at the table would then say, that was an excellent point. I like what Alyssa just said about, and kind of reinforcing that. However, that does once again, put a lot of the responsibility and the work on women to have to be the ones to constantly speak up for one another. So if you are a man in the workplace and you feel comfortable doing so, you can also be that person to echo and reinforce when someone has a good idea. You can be a champion for someone. If you see something that's not okay, mm. you can use your, your power, your privilege um, by way of just the fact that you are a man to to actually step in and say that was not okay or I like what this person said or I think this person deserves promotion um and I think the more that we involve men um to our cause the better off we'll all be I think that's actually a, a great uh note that you're making because that's I think that's a great transition for for our next question actually because uh that's a question about um if you have ever received support from, from a male or, or a female advocate. So can you elaborate on that? Have you actually received that before? And, and how did they actually help you make your workplace more inclusive? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've I've received support from both both um, <clears throat> male and female colleagues and sponsors. And <clears throat> how it worked is sorry. <clears throat> Um, how it worked is that they they helped, they pushed for me to get work assignments that are really um, work, that, that are like um, heavy, significant and make a difference. So allow me to show what I can do. That was like the first important step. And then later on, they advocated for me then to get, if it worked out well, to get the commensurate recognition and, and promotion. Yeah, both, both men and women. And um I, I, th I do think having sponsors is super important for women in the workplace. Um, and, and a good sponsor, um, I would think, is somebody who, who has three things. Who's on the one hand, is um, knows you well, so knows what you can do. Um, and then is somebody who wants to help you, who is motivated to help you. And finally, who wields the credibility within the organization and with others to actually make that difference. And on the top of my head, I have a couple of examples where, where one of these is missing. So I couldn't approach them so easily as sponsors. Or I might, if the first thing is missing, I might have to convince them of what I can do and make sure they see it. Um, 
But there's, thankfully, there are several people who have all three qualities. And, and I think it's, it's very important for us to approach them and ask them to be our sponsors and make a difference for us. I absolutely agree. And I think, um, actually, so I was lucky enough, um, maybe to brag a little bit, was, was added onto um, the Innovate Finance Women in FinTech Power List yesterday. And um, the news came out, and I think it was just incredible the way that um, in, in my industry, there's a lot of um, stuff that happens on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and the way that women were posting, but we're so grateful to the other women that were on the list um, and were very much shouting out the other women that they know, that they have worked with, um, and it created this like increasing bubble of engagement, to put it in social media terms, um, where it was kind of, it was like a tornado just picking up steam and and other bits and people were getting involved and the awareness of it became so big. And I think um, I've been so fortunate that uh, I've had male champions who have recognized some something in me and have put me forward for new roles, have encouraged me to take on more work, more projects. Um, but I've also had, I think, uh, just the the best possible, and I think everyone would say that you know, a network of friends and and professional mentors who are always there to help you. And whether that's preparing for an interview or uh, there was once a meme <laughs> that said, "Behind every strong woman is five women who read her email first. And I I remember when I wanted to negotiate for my uh, salary in a new role, I sent around this email that I was going to send off to like five different women. And they all came back with red lines and edits and said, maybe if you add this or if you word it this way. And so by the time it went, you know, when I finally clicked send, I felt so confident in what I was asking for. Um, and everyone really like not only built me up, but helped make me better. So I think having both is so important, um, but to everything Rebecca already said. Great, thank you so much for both. I think you're touching upon like um, great tips um, that I think we all can uh, can take on. Um, then on that note, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kick on some, some a little bit more country specific questions. Um, so, you know, the, the first one that we can touch upon is uh, if you have ever experienced a difference in the development of gender equality in different countries that you have been working on. So maybe you can touch upon uh, the experience that you've had, you know, in Europe and in the States, um, Africa as well. I think that'll be great. Um, <clears throat> I think we're yeah, course. very well poised for this. Okay. Then. <laughs> Um, I mean, there are large differences, of course. There's like, if, if you look globally, then the differences you'd see between Europe and the US are, are more subtle. Um, and, and also the differences, I mean, within one same country between richer and poorer groups within the population are already different, um, especially if they're large um, inequalities. I mean, the if we if we look at the full global scale, uh, let's say on the on the bottom end, at the saddest end, uh, women's agency, women's property right to themselves is is challenged. Um, they can be given as a gift in marriage and to a friend, and they have no say in it. And sometimes the the gift receiver can't say no. The the woman isn't even asked. Um, and and that happens. That happens in some parts of Africa and and um, different countries and. Um, and or women can't take decisions over their own health. They can't decide um, whether to buy their own medication, whether to go to a doctor at all. And um, so, I, and the, so very essential questions are sometimes missing at the bottom end. On the top end, there are societies that that celebrate women's advancement professionally, um, and uh, and societies where men chip in a lot um, in the house, and I mean time use between the genders is a big deal. Like, what do men do for childcare and cooking in the house, and what do women do? And these two are not the same. I mean, when this is personal anecdotal evidence, but what I saw in in, in a country like Colombia, for example, 
uh, women's and professional advancement is much celebrated. There's, it's no man feels threatened by a woman boss or, and this, this is like, my first experience dates from like 20 years ago. I mean, this was very much celebrated. You have a lot of female engineers. It doesn't necessarily translate inside the household. So the women still have this double charge of being very much the carer and the homemaker, but also having a career. And then other countries like, say, former socialist countries in Eastern Europe, you find in the data that that men sh can ship in quite a lot. I mean, it depends on the country, but that there's a lot of equality within the household as well as in, in professional life. So that's that's if you want the full global scale. And in, in, in different areas of life, you see different um, countries um, being very advanced or, or less advanced. Um. I guess this is the beauty of, of SEMS. We're so widespread and uh, geographically. I actually just finished um, this book. It's called Sex and Lies um, by Leila Slimani. Um, she's a Moroccan author um, and she lives in Paris now, but it was fascinating to, it's basically a, um, a small collection of essays um, and short stories of people that she met, women that she met around Morocco, talking about their rights, their sexuality. Um, I was fascinated to read that um, up until quite recently in Morocco, for example, a woman can be forced um, to marry her rapist, for example. So we are in varying degrees wherever we are around the world. I think um, to speak to my personal experience um, as that third culture kid, as I said, um, I'm American. I work in the UK for a Swedish company, but I'm also, my parents are Indian and Taiwanese. Um, in India, we are still seeing women living in poverty who cannot afford basic um, female hygiene products. There's a brilliant documentary on Netflix I would highly recommend called Period End of Sentence um, and it talks about that and, and the struggle for um, women and the shame that they feel around basic bodily functions. Um, conversely then I work for a Swedish company which the, the Nordics are very well um, rightfully so recognized as being probably the most gender equal countries in the world and seeing you know, we have a female CFO. We have so many women um, in positions of leadership at Klarna, and it's a brilliant thing to see. But then, as Rebecca already alluded to, um, in the U.S., just, you know, we still have not had a female president. And while we may seem quite advanced in the U.S. and the U.K., we're still dealing with problems of um, in the workplace or just basic things like in the U.S., um, every day the right to a woman's own body and right now there is a case coming to the supreme court around abortion rights that is constantly hanging in the balance and so i think it really is fascinating to see how it manifests around the world and um i i would love to see a, a world where all women are equal and everyone is equal but i think we have a lot more work to do so, yeah, so if, if I can chip in there, sorry, just to complete, if that's possible. I, I love your links to literature, Nina. This is <laughs> awesome. I love Leila Slimani. I think she got the Prix Goncourt a few years back about yes. um, a book um, about a family and, and them hiring a nanny. And it is quite, quite dramatic. No, she's, she's amazing. I, I haven't read the book you mentioned, but I want to. Yeah. Um, now, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, we, we, we are speaking um, about these um, geographic differences very much from a sort of advocacy point of view, and that's, that's very important. But there's also some smart economics behind this, because these differences in earnings opportunities of women, they sum up to 172 trillion, okay? If we could make women catch up um, with male earning opportunities in business and work, that's 172 trillion that the world would gain. So there's a, they, my colleagues brought out a recent report on this about that they call it the gender dividend. So mm -hmm. if every step we take towards closing this is actually a, um, a benefit to the world. So do you think that, um, I guess exactly on that note, um, 
if, if the development and, and the welfare of a country is related to actually the gender equality level of that country? That's a question for Rebecca, but I think both of you can probably chip in. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they, <laughs> yeah, there, there is no straight line. There is, there is not really a straight line. So what, what you observe is when you look at um, um, countries, um, welfare level overall, or like, yeah, so sort of GDP per capita, you have a bit of a, a U curve. So, say the very poor country, like, well, let's say <clears throat> it depends on what you measure, right? Um, we economists are always a bit biased by what we can measure. And every year we learn to measure new things, and then the <clears throat> our metrics become a bit more refined. But one measure that we look at a lot is female labor force participation, so the women's access to work at all. And that that is sort of a U curve, meaning the very the very poor countries have very high female labor force participation, but not necessarily high productivity or earnings in that participation. It goes down a bit with the middle income countries, and it rises again with the higher income countries. And then you have a bit of a <clears throat> bumpers in and out according to cultural preferences. So you see that given their income level the Middle East and Turkey have a relatively lower female labor force participation. There is sort of still a strong cultural preference for women being very active in the, in the home versus work. But again, that's all this is dynamic and changing. Um, and in former socialist countries, sometimes you have um, the different, you have like the bump in, basically a cultural preference for women working more. So this is, this is a metric that, that we can capture easily, but labor force participation of course isn't the only agency for women and um yeah there is there is no straight line you'll um you sometimes have a surprisingly high number of women in parliament in relatively poor countries and then you have a surprisingly high number of women not being partic not participating a lot civilly in rich countries and and you have um i mean nina touched on the differences uk us they may be subtle but the U.S. has never had a female president and the U.K. has had two female heads of government and a female head of state since the 1950s. So that, that's already, you know, quite quite a difference, but um, in, in countries that are relatively um, equal wealth wide. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the next question was was exactly about the difference between the U.K. and the U.S., and, but I think we've already touched upon it. So maybe I can, I can have a specific question for you, Nina. Yeah. Uh, working for a Swedish company, mm. how do you think, and we know the, that uh, to a certain degree, gender, um, gender equality is more pronounced here in, in Scandinavia. Um, so working for a Swedish company, do you think that actually resonates um, among all uh, offices, for example, in, in the company? Um, I think that starts to bleed into a little bit of, um, if we all remember our dreaded courses, coursework of um, organizational behavior and culture. Um, so I very much believe, um, I believe it was Shine who wrote about culture and said that it is very much dependent um, on, on the founder and, and the leadership at the very top of the organization. Now at Klarna specifically, um, our entire CXO team, um, it, they're all Swedish. So that works really well for us. Our founder is Swedish. Um, and so perhaps I, I wasn't around 15 years ago when Klarna was founded, but um, perhaps in the way that interactions were held, the way that um, the company has grown has really reinforced that, where it actually, it almost feels like it's almost, it's not really a question that we ever discuss. And I remember um, being in a meeting the other day and I was almost confused <laughs> and so pleased to find that it was um, a meeting of all women. And that rarely happens in FinTech. And there were representatives from product, from legal, um, our legal counsel in the UK is a, is, a Nigerian woman and she's brilliant. And we had um, another Swedish woman in the room who's also a legal representative. And it was just really fascinating to see the way that that's developed. Now, this is not to say that you wouldn't have it or can't have that if you're not Swedish or, you know, Scandinavian. Um, 
I think that it just places a lot on the values that you instill. So um, whether that is making sure that you have flexible working that allows for women who still to this day disproportionately take on the, I shouldn't say burden, but take on the unpaid work of care, whether that's for children or for their parents, um, so that they can work flexibly from home, they can pick up their children, or whether that's um, a very fair and balanced maternity and paternity policy. And even um, as someone who has lived in the UK for a while and briefly went home to the US, even our healthcare options were were very um, Scandinavian in flavor. So um, I think it 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 helps, of course, that um, Sebastian, our CEO, is Swedish. But again, don't let that deter you from founding a business and wanting it to be a gender equal culture. Um, that's, I think, a decision that you, whether you're in a leadership position or just you know whatever position in the company, decide to take forward. Great, thank you for that note. Um, so before I continue to the next question, I'm also uh, just going to remind uh, everyone that you guys can ask questions to Rebecca and Nina. Uh, please use the Q&A function to do that or the uh, chat function if, if you can find the Q&A one. Um, and then we can take these questions at the end so that you know we can have some, some input from you. Um, so whenever you have anything, just uh, shoot it out there. Um, so we touched upon that. So uh, maybe now we can touch a little bit upon the differences um, working in the public and the private sector in terms of gender equality. Um, Rebecca, maybe something that you can touch upon on that. On that. Um, yeah, that's no, that's um, that's a very good question. I mean, <clears throat> overall, and you you see that in the data as well. Um, the public sector is more accountable and has more to account for and has to be a bit more public about what they do. And and it shows. I mean, the gender pay gap is smaller in the public sector um, than it is in the private sector in most countries. Not in all, um, but in most. And um, so I, I would say it, it's it's down to this very high and strong and sometimes rigid legal accountability of the public sector. Um, on the other hand, um, public sectors tend to be less performance sensitive and have left less strong incentives and are a bit, um, say there's less turnover, less dynamism. So an example you have, if you have somebody in, in, in senior management who has performance issues, it may take a while to move that person somewhere else. Whereas in the private sector that would be rather that would happen rather fast because they could not afford um, leaving sort of um, yeah performance issues in place. Their competitive pressure is much higher. So say the the private sector has a much more dynamic pyramid like that where positions open up up more quickly and thereby also generate more opportunities to move up, which can benefit women if you know as society as a whole progresses. Um, but on balance, you do see that you know some. Key points we look at, such as the gender pay gap, are actually um, smaller in the public sector. Great. Um, maybe we can just jump upon like an example that you can give uh, give us um, as a successful uh, female. Can you give us an example of how do you actually strive to close the gender gap in your company or in your sector? I know it's, uh, it's a little bit of a hard and uh, might be a little bit uh, of a yeah, hard question, but it would be great if you can give an example of that. Um, if I can, yeah, I'll jump in. My experience is a predominantly private sector. Um, I did work for the U.S. Embassy for a while um, and hope one day to to enter public service, but I think... Um, I was reading a, an, a report this morning, actually, um, and it was a report by Studio Graphene, they're a tech innovation company, and they carried out a survey with 500 women, and it showed that half of the women in the UK tech environment have experienced some form of discrimination in the workplace, and a fifth of them have resigned in the past because of discrimination or harassment in the workplace. And... Um, I was recently talking to a friend and we were kind of joking and she was saying she, she ran across a woman who worked in tech 
who had been in tech for 10 years. And I said, yeah, my mother was a QA engineer for Hewlett Packard for 25 plus years. And we laughed and we go, wow, I didn't know anyone made it past five years. Um, because notoriously tech is this industry that proclaims to be at the forefront of equality and, and quite liberal and progressive in its values. And yet um, we see cases like Susan Fowler um, at Uber or Ellen Powell at uh, Kleiner Perkins. These are very US specific examples, but even Google recently, there were lo lots of walkouts because of sexual discrimination. Um, for me, I think so it's kind of twofold. It's one, how do we fix the existing problems and how do we retain and actually reintroduce, um, especially to women who have been re returning from whatever reason, usually caretaking responsibilities. And the second is how do we fill the pipeline with, um, with young women, young girls? I think it's funny because um, I was reading that actually we don't really have a pipeline problem in developed Western nations because women are disproportionately receiving higher education degrees. They're disproportionately becoming lawyers, doctors. Um, and there are a lot of women that are seeking out um, these male, you know, traditionally or, or thought of traditionally male roles like engineering, uh, which I find very funny because um, small fact, I guess, for those that have watched the movie Hidden Figures, um, the first, quote, computers at NASA were actually women. So a woman who computed uh, mathematical equations was a computer. And Katherine Johnson recently passed away, but she was one of the first, um, or most well-known from that, that storyline. Um, I think what I try to do is advocate and use my voice. Um, I think I have been absolutely called a difficult woman. I've been called a feminist killjoy. <laughs> um, I've been called any number of actually very hurtful and offensive things, but I use the voice that I have and the privilege I have to point out when there is a problem. Um, if someone has been overlooked for a promotion, if um, there needs to be attention drawn to the fact that isn't it strange how our churn rate with women or the churn rate for women at a particular company is quite high. Um, and then beyond that, I do volunteer quite a lot of my time to helping um, grow that pipeline. So for me, um, actually, I, I used to work in the same office as the company that um, published the Rebel Girls book, uh, Good Night Stories for rebel girls, um, whether that is going and volunteering at a school or um, up until recently, I volunteered for an organization called I Can Be, which um, in the UK brings disadvantaged young girls into workplaces for um, non-stereotypically uh, female professions, uh, whether that's a police officer or a firewoman or someone working in tech, and it brings them in and, and shows them what they can aspire to be. So I think a lot of it is, has to be action. Um, it's, and I, I also will caveat that not everyone wants to scream from the rooftops, not everyone feels comfortable or has the audience or platform to do so. Um, but I think a lot of it is actually speaking up, actually doing something. Um, and that helps me sleep at night. <laughs> that, that is awesome. If I may jump on that, I think that's that's great. And one one can hear the um, the passion in you actually to to fight for this um, um, this cause, which is amazing. And I must say, I experience the same. I find it one of the most rewarding things when I find a colleague who has it in a way who has similar issues than me, but worse than me. So. In particular, when, when I see women who are at the beginning of their careers, uh, maybe at a, in a decentral office, so far from headquarters, not with the same connections to headquarters or to, to, to colleagues as I have, I just, um, I love basically working with them and helping them move forward. And 
funny or not funny, I find often that they don't even dare be ambitious. So they don't even dare formulate goals. So I, I love to be like their ambition and their their bad cop because sometimes women get blamed for being ambitious, um, as you also said, and, and help them formulate their goals and helping help them tick off the hurdles one by one, you know, administrative or otherwise. And it's it's the most 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 rewarding thing. And of course it's you know it's it's one at a time and I'm not sure it ever or, or when it will make um, a systemic difference. But it's um yeah it's it's great. It's and it's not it's as much receiving as giving I find when you when you have a mentoring relationship like that. That's great. Thank you so much. I think these were some really great, great examples from both of you. Um, we have a, we have actually a question from Melissa. Uh, so maybe we can take that. Um, so the question goes, how can SEPSIS incorporate more gender equality friendly initiatives in his or her everyday life? So uh, what, what, can any of you maybe touch upon that? <laughs> well. I think that Rebecca and I have given a plethora of, of resources um, to begin with. Um, for me, funnily enough, I think the I, at LSE, I don't know across the other SEM schools, um, for the LSE Masters in Management that is tied to SEMs, um, it actually, when I was in my cohort and the one before and after was almost... Um, 50 50 in gender split and it was actually fascinating to see just in that and I later spoke to our director of studies who's no longer with the program but she said that that was a very intentional thing um when you have these people and at SEMS we are our goal is is noble to create these um global leaders for the future who will span across all industries when you just see in your day-to-day -day life capable women, uh, whether that is presenting in class, whether that is presenting a business case project, um, whether that is running a SEMS club, uh, taking responsibility for work, I think that then really sets an example moving forward. I remember in my course, and I won't name names, and, and it was not met in a malicious way, but um, one of my classmates came up to me after I gave a presentation and he did, he wasn't meaning to be malicious, but he did say, um, that was brilliant. What a great presentation. I never would have thought to speak, to listen to a woman speak for that long. And it was kind of a backhanded compliment, but I, I don't get angry about it. And some people do, but the reason I don't get angry is because I hope that by seeing me present, it shifted his perception of what a woman is capable of doing. And so in the future, should he hire, should he um, build a team, should he um, promote someone that he will remember that and remember the, the countless experiences like that. Um, and that having had that shifted perspective will rely on that moving forward. Um, yeah, no, that's that's a great example. I think there's there, there, there are two two or three things that come to mind. I think we could all do in our workplaces that and um, Sam's alumni can do. So number one, again, the implicit bias. I think to educate yourself and your surroundings about the implicit bias because it's going to play into hiring decisions, promotion decisions, any committee that decides on things that affect women. Um, feedback, reviews, it, it's going to play into this. So best to get really educated on this, educate others on it, so we become all a bit more self-aware and, and conscious. Um, the second one is very, very similar to what Nina said. If you see someone struggle, but, or just, just be sensitive, you probably will see that there's, you, know, you have a colleague that you like and admire and and, and she's she's struggling. She's not getting the recognition she's she's supposed to get. Be her advocate. Be her ally. Um, I think that that would be that, that that would go so far and and would be so so appreciated. And 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 finally, and, and Nina also touched upon it. Um, 
uh, be brave yourself. If you're a woman yourself, be brave, be unashamed, be ready for envy and, you know, maybe some mean comments and um, misunderstandings and whatnot. But don't hold yourself back because somewhere there may be a, a person that's silent that's looking for you. And and I see with with myself and with my colleagues, but also with my daughters, how important role models are. Um, it makes all the difference. So even if it's against out of your own comfort zone, against your own discomfort, oh, I don't want to step up, I don't want to say something now, break through it because you're doing it for someone else. Thank you. I think that was actually a really nice way to probably have a good wrap up of everything because uh, you actually, I think, summarized wonderful advices that all of us can take, male and female, um, in terms of you know promoting gender equality not only in the workplace but also among us and at school and at SEMS and also among business schools. So on that note, I guess I'll just give you like a last chance if there's anything you'd like to add on the topic. Otherwise, I think you've, you've definitely were wonderful people to um, to have for this webinar because you touched and gave great examples on where we can start and where we can drive. Uh, the gender equality, but just final words for each of you. Um, yeah, if I think I, I think it was one of the later a uh, different question that we had, but I am um, not to not to be negative about it, but I think um, when we talk about gender equality, we sometimes think about it as a tick box and like check did that done. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, where we currently sit, According to the World Economic Forum, we will not have uh, gender pay parity in t uh, for another 257 years. Currently in the UK, there are more CEOs on the FTSE 100 named John or David than there are women. Um, and so I think the message that I want to leave people with is that the work is never, never, never done. Um, one of my favorite quotes is um, there. Were, uh, it's attributed to a, actually a woman, and mistakenly was first attributed to a man. But she asked Benjamin Franklin, and she said, "Well, Doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy?" And he responded, "A republic, if we can keep it." And similarly, it's the idea that the work is never done, um, just as we every day you know, in our day-to-day -day lives as citizens exercise the rights that we have and the right to vote to maintain our democracy. I think the work of gender equality is never done. There are, as I already mentioned, um, there's always people that will want that will want to take away rights, like in the US right now with abortion, for example. Um, and so it is tiring sometimes but we do have to stay vigilant and continue working and advocating for each other um, but I promise it is so worth it um, to see how far we go. Yes yes I fully agree I think the, the bottom line is um, we're not there yet and sometimes if we look at, at certain facts they make, can, can be sobering but it, it's not an option to give up. It's not an option not to fight, especially if we have, you know, wonderful allies like like Sems, who's calling this webinar, which I find is it's a great initiative and shows already the sensitivity and and the the the, uh, the passion for the cause in in the team. So um, I congratulate you on that, and and I think we need more on, of that. We need we need to let the light in. We need to sort of highlight what works and what doesn't work and and make the the subtle and the hidden visible i think that would be sort of my key message for for the more developed western societies like make sure you put a name on it and you 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 you, you show what's happening and that you know you call situations out and um that that's sort of there the key part of the struggle and across the globe of course there are um let's not forget our privilege um we are, we are quite privileged in the way that we have like full agency over our lives. We can decide who we marry, when we marry, where we live, what we study. You know, that's, that's a lot of agency that is absolutely unthinkable for many women on the globe. So 
Um, my other thing would be then sort of to think also globally and maybe take up a cause or advocate for a cause such as child marriage. Child marriage holds women back globally terribly and is, is behind um, very high and sometimes health detrimental fertility rates. It's a pervasive issue. It is so totally off our radar in a way in, in the West because it's not uh, it's it's not a thing, but globally it, it actually has a huge impact. So um, yeah, so two things. Let's let's make the subtle more visible and talk about it like we're doing today. And also let's maybe each if we if we find it in ourselves, take up a cause to advocate for that that um, concerns people globally. And thanks so much for having us today. I think it was absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed this no end chatting with you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Thank you also for being so open and personal and giving like some real hands-on examples and, and advices on, on books and whatnot to actually educate ourselves further. So I really appreciate um, both of you uh, tuning in for this webinar. I think it was great that we had you. Um, and on that note, I guess I would uh, also thank you to the attendees that asked questions and that uh, during the webinar. So we can all make this a little bit more um, fruitful. But uh, thank you. And otherwise, if we don't have anything else, I guess I'll just wish everybody, wherever you are around the world, to have a wonderful day or rest of your day. Happy International Women's Day on Sunday. Yes. Go thank a woman. <laughs> thank her every day, but. <laughs> Especially on that day. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Thank you all. Have a great day. Have Bye. a good one, everyone.